Hello, uh, I'm, I'm Keith Cooper, and um, I'm going to be talking in this webinar uh, a bit about using tilt shift lenses. Now, one of the things about tilt shift lenses is that a lot of people don't actually appreciate all the things you can do with them. So I'm going to go through some um, some pictures showing examples of the use of tilt shift lenses and a little of the principles behind using them. Now, I most definitely will not be addressing use of the Scheinflug principle or anything like that. There is no maths in this whatsoever. Now, I've got a strong belief that, um, that knowing the principles of how tilt works on lenses is really useful if you're doing a course on optics or have to write an essay on it. But for actually taking photographs, you really don't need to know. So anyway, um, I'm going to kick off and run through a load of photos that I've got here, show some examples of them, of, of the potential use of such lenses. And um, hopefully uh, we've got questions and answers at the end. So if there's anything you're not sure of, type in one of the questions. Uh, somebody else is monitoring the questions and they'll feed them through to me. So we'll have a Q&A session at the end in probably about three quarters of an hour or so. Uh, after we've run through all of this. But put your questions in and hopefully it'll be useful. Now, I'm going to now switch over. Uh, please excuse any slight technical glitches. Um, I am not an experienced presenter using this uh, online system we've got here. So uh, I will do my best in uh, showing things. Now, you should now see a photograph, uh, albeit with me in the corner of it, which I will get rid of in a moment because that gets in the way. Um, this is a picture taken with tilt, uh, with the lens tilted. There's no shift in this. This is just using lens tilt. And this is often called the miniature world effect or the small world effect. There's loads of different ways there. And some people have even called it the tilt shift effect. Um, and this is the entirety of what people think tilt shift lenses do. It is but a tiny part of what they do. Now, this particular instance, and I'm going to uh, attempt to remove myself from here so that uh, you can see the whole picture. Picture. There we go. I believe I'm not now impinging on the picture. If you look at this, uh, this is a photograph that's taken here in Leicester where I live and this is looking down on the river and you can see there's a boat going along which is sharp and you can also see if you look over towards the left you can see a car. Now that's also sharp. In fact if you look at the picture carefully and hopefully it's large enough on your screen so that you can actually see this, um, you'll see that there is a band of sharpness that runs across the image. That's because of the lens tilt. Now, I'll come back to this later, but uh, first of all, I'm going to be looking at shift. because shift is by far an easy way, the easiest to understand. Um, the lenses tend to be called tilt shift lenses. There are actually two different functions. Tilt is not the same as shift. So this is a tilted lens uh, and that produces the weird focus effects. Now, if you want to do some of this stuff like this, I've, I've written about it. I've got lots of articles written about it. Um, I've written a book all about using these lenses that covers everything that I'm going to try and address here in the webinar this evening. And uh, if you want more details, I've got articles. I've got a YouTube channel which has got some videos about it as well. But let's just move from that picture there to look at one. Now move to the next. Here we go. This is a set of tilt shift lenses. These happen to be Canon lenses. Now I got these from Park Cameras several years ago, a uh, UK dealer I've, I've got my pro kit from for quite a few years. Um, the middle one is one of the old tilt shift lenses. That's the original Canon 24 millimeter. The one on the right is the Mark II 24 millimeter. Now I'm showing Canon lenses here because I use Canon gear. Um, I've got reviews and tests of the Nikon stuff as well. So it's not a, you know, this is not a Canon only thing. Uh, Nikon do lenses, Lauer do some lenses, and there are quite a few other lenses as well. I've covered a lot of them. And uh, if you want more details, have a look on the Northlight Images website where I've got all the reviews. Um, so those are two 24 millimeter lenses. 
And over on the left hand side, the one with the uh, bulbous front element that people always ask me when they see it, is that a fisheye lens? No, it's not a fisheye lens, it's a 17 mil tilt shift lens. You can see on the lens, there's a little dial um, in the middle of it, that and there's a, a scale next to it, you can see on all three lenses, that's where you set the tilt and the lens tilts backwards and forwards and you set that. Now, in these particular lenses, you can see some dials and some adjustment knobs on the side of the lenses as well. And those are for setting the shift. Now you set tilt and shift independently, which means that of course you don't have to actually use tilt and shift together. You can use one, you can use another, use different amounts of them. Now, if you look at the lenses as well, you'll see all three of them, there is a focus scale. And that's because almost always, in fact, I cannot think of one that isn't at the moment, uh, tilt shift lenses are fully manual. Uh, they don't have autofocus. So if you're uncomfortable with uh, manual focus lenses, well, that's going to be your first challenge in learning to use one of these lenses. You have to focus the lens manually. Now, these are Canon lenses, so they're auto aperture. But you set these. I've used these on uh, EF bodies, so I've used it on a Canon 5DS, which is 50 megapixel. I've used them with adapters on RF mount cameras as well, and they work perfectly well with that. Similarly, I've used um, Nikon's lenses. Nikon have got a 24 millimeter lens, tilt shift lens. They call it a perspective control or PCE lens. And uh, they've got a 24 mil. They've also got a 19 millimeter lens. Um, they are wide angle lenses, uh, particularly when you add the shift. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit when I show some of the reasons why you might actually use shift. But there are three examples of the lenses. The Canon one in the middle, the old original one that dates from the 1990s, is a little bit soft if you push the shift to extremes. And it's a distinct improvement. Uh, the second version when it came out was much better. Uh, but you can pick these up uh, secondhand. And uh, there are other ones. Uh, Samyang make a 24 mil tilt shift lens, which is good for experimenting with. It's cheaper. Keep an eye out if you do want tilt shift lenses for uh, secondhand ones, because quite often uh, people buy lenses like this. They use them. They realize they haven't got a clue how to use them. They don't use them much and then they sell them. So there's a steady supply of tilt shift lenses usually available, used and second hand. So that uh, save you a bit of uh, effort there. Now, this is the uh, Canon 50 mil lens. And I put this on here to show some of the complexities of movements that you get. Now, if you have experience of large format cameras with full movements on it, then this can seem quite restrictive. However, for use on cameras like this, and they work perfectly well on crop cameras and different size sensors, um, these are all the movements you need. Now, so if you're used to using stuff with you know, front and rear standards, uh, large format photography, this must seem a bit basic to you. But you should know all this stuff anyway if you're successfully using big cameras like that. But anyway, here it is. Here's the 50 mil. This is a really good quality lens. This is one of Canon's latest tilt shift lenses. And I've put in a collection of movements here. You can see that the lens, you can see the tilt fairly obviously. It's been tilted by eight degrees. You can see this one focuses quite close. Uh, it's as a one-to-one -one macro. Uh, one to I think so. It's, no, one to two macro, so not quite one to one on this one. You can use extension tubes though with them, they do work perfectly well. You can see the shift on the side of it, it's on the top there, and also the whole lens can be rotated as well. Now, if you're wondering what all these different movements do, they all contribute to different things you can do with the camera and with the lens attached on it. So there we go, we've got one that's um, that set that lens there. It's, quite an expensive lens. It's also an impressively sharp lens. Now, what do we do with it? This is, this is the typical problem of shooting a building. Now, I'm an architectural photographer. I do other stuff as well, industrial and whatever, but I do quite a bit of architecture. And this is the typical problem you get with a wide angle lens. And now I'm looking now just at the uses of shift in these next few examples. Now, classic thing, you point the camera upwards and everything appears to be leaning over backwards. 
Now, this is quite an extreme example, and I've, I've picked it to deliver, deliberately make the point. But um, you might think that you know, if it's at this much of a lean, then you're doing it on purpose. Uh, where it gets more of a problem is where you are only tilting the camera upwards a little bit, and you're only getting a little bit of convergence of verticals. Well, it looks a bit wrong. Um, and certainly if you've got uh, clients who are architects, they like seeing vertical elements of their buildings shown as vertical. I'll show you the same building from slightly further back using a different lens, but this time shifted upwards. Now, my eye level, where I'm taking the picture from, is probably about equal to that small tree in front of the entrance to the building. But we're seeing quite a bit of the sky and we're actually looking upwards, but the camera is level. And this is the first and most common use of shift in tilt shift lenses. In fact, you can get shift only lenses. Um, I looked at a lower 15 millimeter shift lens uh, a while ago, really good optical quality. That is only shift, there's no tilt in it. Uh, tilt tends to be used far less frequently. Now, I've got some specific stuff about uh, tilt, which I'll cover later on, but this is shift and this is the most common use. I've shifted the lens upwards so the camera is perfectly level. If I had the camera perfectly level, I'd have too much foreground in the picture. So by shifting the lens upwards, I get a view effectively looking upwards, but without pointing the camera upwards. And as you can see by the verticals on the sides of the buildings, they're all pretty straight. Um, does mean that if you want to do this properly, you do have to be careful about leveling your camera. The wider lens you use, the more slight leveling errors will show up, particularly at strong shift. And if there's the, probably the most common mistake I notice if I'm shooting in a hurry is that I may not have leveled the camera properly. And there's a slight bit of lean. Now, fortunately you can fix that in Photoshop. Um, but I don't like, I'd much rather do it in the camera and use the whole image. Now, you might think, well, hang on, um, I can open this file, a raw file that I've taken in Photoshop and I've got perspective correction. I can apply perspective correction. Why bother all this faffing around with an expensive lens? Um, and yes, they, they are relatively expensive lenses. They're good quality lenses. Why would I not do this correction in software? Well. The moment that you take an image, and uh, if we took one like that, you could correct it. The moment that I take an image like that and correct it, I end up having to crop the image. And the problem is, the more extreme the correction is required, the more unpredictable the crop is going to be. There's an image that's taken with a shift lens, there's just a wide angle lens. Now, um, I always include a few like this when I'm doing an architectural shoot anyway, because some people, you know, typically in the design departments, quite like stuff at wacky angles like this. However, architects in general detest it. And since it's the architects who usually hire me to do the work, uh, they get photos more like that. Um, so that's your, that's your classic use of shift. It's really quite simple. Keep the camera absolutely level and then raise or lower the camera, uh, the lens, to get the amount of the composition you want. Now, I've got another example of it. Let's go here. This is yeah, an evening shot. Um, I wanted to keep the vertical elements of the building. It's a cricket pavilion in Leicestershire. And this was a photograph taken for the architects. And I wanted to keep those elements of the vertical supports and the glazing as properly vertical. Now in this picture, all I've done is I've set the camera up and I've shifted it upwards a bit. Now it's cropped a little bit here to fit on a 16-9 ratio, but it has got vertical shift. You can always spot when the shift has been used if you work out where your eye position would be, where your, where your camera position is on the image. So if looking at this image here, you can see from the, on the veranda, you can see I'm probably at about that level. Now, you've got more of the picture above it than below, so it's been shifted upwards. It's not much shift uh, in terms of actually taking your pictures. This particular picture was taken with a Canon 1DS Mark III, 
uh, some time ago, and uh, it's that was a DSLR. I mentioned that you have to do manual focus. You also, with certainly with uh, DSLRs, need to be careful in handling exposure because one of the problems is that uh, any movements of the lens really throws out the uh, the metering of the camera so if you're going to do a shot like this you need to manually focus you also need to probably manually set your exposure you set your exposure before you add any shift because adding shift can cause unpredictable reactions with the camera's metering system um, as i said it's manual focus anyway so we don't need to worry about autofocus because that just doesn't happen with things like this now if i go to another example with a shot this is uh, in seattle smith tower in seattle shows the quite strong perspective you can get now you can see this is shifted up rather a lot um, i'm my eye level is about level with the dashboard of that pickup that's in front and there's quite a lot of vertical shift now one of the problems with extreme vertical shift like this is that image quality falls off as you tend to shift certainly this was taken on the old original canon uh, 24 mil lens and the image is a bit soft towards the top you need to stop down a bit more when you're doing much shift so this is with the camera uh, the camera is level cameras in portrait orientation and the shift and the lens shift mechanism has been rotated so that the shift is upwards and I can see the top of the building. Now, this is with 24 mil lens. You get quite a strong potential for making use of perspectives, leading lines, all the usual compositional tricks. You've got exactly the same sort of stuff with a lens like this as you would in a wide angle lens or any other lens you might choose to use, but you're getting the equivalent of a wider angle. So although this is a 24 millimeter lens, if I had just a prime lens on the camera at the time and had the camera level, I'd need something equivalent of about 14 millimeter, maybe even less than that, to be able to get the top of the building in with the camera level. So effectively, I'm just making use of shift here to allow me to take a shot of a 24 mil lens rather than a much wider lens and then crop the bottom off which is one way you can get around the converging verticals. So that's we're looking at that. Uh, next one up, I've got um, a shot. This was taken in Wells Cathedral. And um, it's based on a shot by F.H. Evans taken in 1905. Would have been using a large view camera uh, with movements. So it's got shift there as well. And it uh, that picture is quite a famous architectural picture concentrates mainly on the steps and the uh, opening at the top through to the doorway that you can see there. Now, this is a much wider angle than Evans could have managed in 1905. This was taken using the Canon 17 mil shift lens. And I've got quite a bit of vertical shift here to get the look up the stairs and not get any convergence of verticals. And uh, it works, this was taken um and was intended for a large print um, it's an image i've always liked uh, it was one of the first images i looked at years ago that you know, got my interest in architectural photography going and also in visiting a lot of the big cathedrals around the uk uh, we are we have some superb architecture if you're interested in that stuff and um, I never have any problems taking photographs apart from Durham because Durham Cathedral for some reason doesn't allow you to take photos don't know why but um, yeah they're, they're like that but this is at Wells Cathedral and if you get a chance go and have a look at it it's a superb cathedral but I'm just using a bit of vertical uh, vertical shift here 17 mil and one other thing this one was taken handheld you can use tilt and shift lenses handheld perfectly well you need to be a bit careful in exactly in perfecting your technique so that you don't accidentally point the ca camera off true so you're not sort of pointing the camera upwards downwards and like that bit of practice though um i will happily use a 24 millimeter lens as my sort of you know walking around lens for visiting cities and the likes uh, perfectly well for stuff like this you can see very easily um, it's 
I would have had some camera shake maybe if I'd not been careful. I was leaning against something probably here. It's not that bright, but um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with using uh, tilt shift lenses handheld. Um, nothing wrong whatsoever. Now, this is just the lens with level camera pointed upwards. Now the picture, uh, the camera here is in portrait orientation. So if you think of the camera uh, rotated back to landscape orientation, the shift axis, which is the direction the lens shift moves on, becomes left right. So you could actually, you don't have to have up down shift, you can have sideways shift as well. Now sideways shift is not so commonly used. Uh, something to experiment with, I've got quite a lot of stuff covering it and look at articles and things looking at it, but sideways shift doesn't tend to be used nearly so often. But there is a, an example, and uh, this shot here, you might think, oh, well, it's yet another picture where I have looked at a building and I've shifted the lens upwards. Well, yes, I have shifted the lens upwards. However, where am I pointing the camera? I'm pointing the camera down the walkway. We can see along it. So the camera itself is pointing along that walkway underneath the overhang towards the distance. And you can see clearly where I'm pointing the camera. However, if I just used vertical shift, that walkway would be in the center of the camera, in the center of the photo. It's not in the center of the photo because I've offset it to the side. And I've offset it to the side by using what's called diagonal shift. Now, this is where the lens, rather than shifting it horizontally vertical. Now, I'm, I, I say horizontal vertical, um, some people will know for other terms for this of add a rise or fall or shift. Um, I tend to use, uh, because I, I'm, I'm doing stuff for people using lenses like this, I tend to call it shift and a direction. So vertical shift, horizontal shift, diagonal shift. Now, in this particular instance, the lens is shifted upwards and to the left. So there we go, it's shifted across. Now, how do I know that this works? You look in the viewfinder, or if you're using mirrorless, on the back. And here's another example of it. And this is using diagonal shift. Now, here, if I'd, I'm pointing the camera, and you can see, towards the base of the white building, now, if you look towards the white building there, um, that is offset. Now, I've used vertical shift because the building itself is vertical. Yeah, there are no converging lines. If I just pointed the camera where it is pointing now and not use diagonal shift, in this case, it's diagonally upwards and to the right. If I'd not used the diagonal shift, I would have an awful lot of that brown building, which I don't really want in the shot because I want the pathway to the side of the building as well. So in this one, I've used diagonal shift to the right. And in the previous one, diagonal shift upwards and to the left. Now, one thing I should mention about this for landscape use, and I have done a video about this, is that if you use diagonal shift with a widish lens, and 24 mil is wide in this context, you can produce some interesting effects in the sky and give the impression that clouds are also emanating from one side or the other. Um, I'm not going to show some examples here, so I've got a video about it. Uh, if you just look for Keith Cooper's YouTube channel and look, do stuff on tilt shift, you'll find loads of little bits of videos. But for landscape photography, it's quite an interesting trick and allows you to change the emphasis of where you want people to look. It's uh, in the same way as this. You can see a bit of it in the clouds in this on the right hand side. If you follow them back, they all point backwards into that left hand corner of the building. Um, and that's just a, a trick because you're using a wide angle lens. Now, I'm just um, seeing here someone who said, uh, uh, let me just read this, uh, Durham Cathedral and was allowed to take photos. Oh, excellent. Um, I wish I'd known that last week when I was in Durham because I would have stopped off and had a look. 
uh, my apologies to disparaging Durham. Um, they are no longer on my naughty list for not allowing photographers. That's great news. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, I'll go through some of the other questions at the end because they're quite small text. I'm going to have to read the stuff. Now, let's see. We've got diagonal shift. So we've got up, vertical shift. Yeah. What about using a picture taken with no shift and a picture with some shift, stitching two together? And here we got a picture. This is taken uh, two shots, one with no shift and one with some vertical shift. Now, as long as the camera is steadily mounted on the tripod so it doesn't move between the shots, you will find you can very easily do a flat stitch of the two images. Now, there is potential here for some parallax effects because technically the lens should stay fixed and the camera should move up and down for a shot like this. In normal use, as long as you're careful about your foreground and background, that doesn't cause a problem. But there are ways around that. It's a bit more specialized. I've got it covered in the book and I've got some articles about using devices to allow you to do photographs without perspective problems here. But this one here was taken with a 17 mil lens. Uh, it's two shots. There, uh, there's considerable overlap of them and they are just flat stitched together to give you a view like that. And that's with a really quite wide angle lens. Now, you can do up and down shifts, you can do left, right shifts. In fact, if you really want to, you can do diagonal shifts. So you can do a diagonal shift upwards to the left, upwards to the right, downwards to the left, downwards to the right, so you get four photos. You then stitch those together and it will give you an extremely wide view. Certainly with the uh, TSE 17 millimeter that I took this photo with, the full stitch of, uh, if you do a stitch, stitch um, and do your um, shift in all the different directions, the full shift gives you an equivalent of about a 10 millimeter focal length. It's, it's huge, but you get then all the problems you expect of using a lens that wide. If it's uh, your, a lens, you'll get, um, distortions and other problems with it. Now, talking of distortions, um, you don't tend to get the lenses because they're rather good uh, for these. You don't tend to get much in the way of geometric distortions. Because the shift and the tilt of the lens, and I will come back to tilt in a bit, um, because the shift and the tilt is manually set, the tilt and shift values are not recorded at all in the image EXIF data. Now that means you can't use automatic correction for correcting lens errors, lens aberrations. Turns out that it's certainly opening RAW images in Adobe Camera RAW has no, the modern version has no problem in fixing uh, chromatic aberration in uh, shifted images. But if you want to do geometric corrections and uh, say you've got a lens like the Samyang 24 mil which has a slightly more obvious barrel distortion to it then you have to do various other techniques to try and fix the correction um, it can be done um, I've, I've written about it I've got some articles you know once again uh, it's in the book um, and also an article on the North Light Images website looking at aspects of that. So that's how you're correcting things. But you tend to notice that if you once you do stitching and stuff. Now, I promised I would actually get to tilt eventually. And okay, right, there we go. Now, this particular picture was taken with a 55 millimeter tilt lens. Um, you know, people who know lenses may go 55 mil tilt. What's that? There isn't one. You're right. There isn't a widely available that I know of uh, 55 mil tilt lens. This particular lens was a medium format uh, lens, uh, Mamiya 645 lens, and I've used it with an adapter on an RF mount camera. So I've got a tilt shift adapter that allows me to use uh, medium format lenses as for tilt and or shift as I need it. And I've used this. This is shot on a Canon EOS RP, if I remember rightly. It might have been an R5, but I think it was an RP. And this is using an adapter with an old manual for, uh, lens. Now, this you can see if we go back to that shot 
right at the start when I showed the uh, the, the boats uh, that looks like a model boat, uh, yeah, the model world look. That's a horizontal band of sharpness. Here we've got a vertical band of sharpness. Now, if I'm standing on the towpath, and this is the canal in Leicester, if I'm looking along there, you can see clearly the direction I'm pointing the camera. You can also see that the zone of sharpness is just off to the left of me. So I'm standing roughly along the line that heads off in the middle of the picture, uh, goes you know, on the edge of the water, uh, that's the edge of the towpath and the birds and the water there. You can see that zone of sharpness that runs right the way through into the distance. And you can see the guy walking across the bridge. Um, I, this is taken handheld. I'm watching, um, you know, through, I've decided what I want in the shot. I'm looking through the viewfinder. I see the guy walking across and I wait until he just walks into the zone of sharpness and click, that's the picture. How have I set the lens to do this? Now, this is just using tilt. I've tilted the lens to the left. If I tilt the lens to the left, the plane of focus moves. Now, I'll show an example of this in a little bit of how, how you do this, but I've moved the plane of focus and it's now running to my left. I've tilted the lens to the left. How do I know where that plane of focus is going to run? It purely depends on the focal length of the lens. And I'll show the examples in a moment of how you actually work that out, how you actually decide where you want things to place things. But you can, this is why I separate tilt and shift. This, this one takes a little bit more getting your head around than the shift. Shift, well, I found when I'm sort of doing talks to people and explaining stuff, people pick up shift fairly quickly. Tilt takes a bit more thinking about and a little bit more experimentation. I say, this one here, I've, shift, I've tilted the lens to the left, it's focused at infinity. Now, infinity focus and that bit of towpath right in front of me is sharp, as is the distance. The plane of focus has been completely swung round to run by the side of me. Uh, another example of that would be this shot here. Now here, I've tilted the lens downwards. Now, I've tilted the lens downwards here. I know what the focal length is, so I know where the focal plane is going to run, and I'll, I'll show you how I know that in a moment. But effectively, the plane of sharp focus is running along the boards. So this seating that's here, I've made that sharp. Now, I've stopped down a little bit, but not too much because I still want to show the outer focus areas. So we've got um, if I took this at f4, which is what the lens is, this is using the 17 millimeter uh, tilt shift lens, uh, the TSE 17, tilted downwards at infinity focus. Now, infinity focus with that instance, for the camera level, the plane of focus runs underneath me and out to the distance. If I wanted the whole shot clear, let's say I'm using this to try and get more depth of field in landscape photography. I have to be really careful here because with the, with the lens set at infinity, the plane of focus is running horizontally out in front of me. I could change the focus and the plane of focus will shift upwards or downwards. It will tilt. So the top of that building, I could bring that into focus. But if I did bring the top of the building into focus, I'd risk losing the sharp focus of the uh, planks of wood in the mid ground. So it's a very thin plane of focus. Now, I can stop down here. So if I, this, this is probably at F5.6. Now, if I stop this down to F16, or F22, we would get sharpness all over the picture. But you do have to be careful when you're stopping down, obviously, because the more you stop down, at a certain point, you're going to get diffraction effects and you'll start getting softness from diffraction. Now, just because I've tilted the plane of focus over here, and if I just go back to the previous one, which was shot at F2.8, if I remember correctly, um, you'll see it is very thin. 
Now, the plane of focus in the distance, there's a distant bridge you may be able to see. Now, the plane of focus there is across the width of the bridge, almost. Close to me, the plane of focus is very, very thin. Now, it, that's because rather than being a solid plane of focus, it's a, it is a wedge of focus. So it is narrow close to you and opens up further away. If I were to stop down with this image, you would see in the distance, you would see things getting sharper and also the zone of thickness of where the guy walking across the top, where that's sharp, you'd also notice that improving a bit. If I go back to that one, there we go, we've got a picture there, which as I say, that's with a plane of focus running uh, along the bottom. Right, now, an example of how to actually do this. And um, this is something I would say, if, you've, if you're going to explore tilt, have a go at doing some of these experiments I'm going to show. Now, here we go. Here's the top of my desk. It's a little distorted um, because I've tried to even everything out. And you can see the keyboard at the top is a little bit stretched now. But the idea is there's the camera at the side. Now, that's Canon uh, 5DS. Or is it not? No, that's that's my Canon. That's a EOS RP. So I get the get the right way around. Um, and it's a TSE 17 millimeter lens. We've got 17 mil lens, and you can see it is tilted by quite a bit. In fact, it's tilted as much as I possibly could get it. You can't tilt it anymore. Now, the subjects on the uh, um, on the desk there. I'm going to show how you can get both of sets of them in focus, one at a time, obviously not all of them, um, depending on how you set just the focus of the lens. Now, here's the setup, and here's the photograph from that, well, actually two photos. The top half of the image shows where the focal plane runs with the focus set at 40 millimeters, sorry, 40 centimeters on the lens. That's relatively close. That's almost as close as I think that lens will focus. And you can see the line of cars running across at the top, they're sharp. You can see the plane of focus extends beyond the line of cars into the uh, work lamp and beyond. You can see some other stuff on my desk and you see it. And if you look at the line of cars on the edge of the desk, this is in the top half of the image, you can see they're out of focus. Now, the picture that is at the bottom, all I have done is change the focus from, inf from 40 centimeters to infinity. I haven't changed anything else. I haven't moved the car. And you can see how the plane of focus has swung around and it now runs along the edge of the desk. So if you just look at the two of them, one with, is with the lens set at close focus and one is with it set at infinity. If I just go back, we've got that, that's the setup. So at close focus, the plane of focus runs along those diagonal line of cars, and at infinity focus, it runs along the uh, other, where the car and the two dice are. I just go back, there's the difference. There's no change in setup between them, other than I've just changed the focus of the lens. And there's nothing more to, to it than that. And that's how tilt can work. Now, how did I know how far it was from where the camera is to the edge of desk to know that the plane of focus at infinity would run along the edge of the desk? Well, this is the bit where I, guess, this is, I did say there was no maths, almost. Um, you can get apps that will do this. I have a, and this is a complex version because it's in feet and inches and covers lots of lenses. And this is actually just looking at the different focal lengths, the amount of tilt that you're using and how far it is to the uh, plane of focus at infinity. Now, uh, it's very difficult to show this in just numbers. So have a look at one of the videos I've got describing it um, or have a look at one of the articles and I've got that, or even better still, yeah, there's the book. I believe I mentioned the book before, yes. Um, and that's the results. And the bit those tables tell me, and uh, you know, there are simplified versions of the tables you can download and print out. And there is the actual setup for Tilt. So it's 
infinity focus runs along the edge of the desk there so that's the two dice are in focus close focus the plane of focus swings round and runs through the line of cars but there we go there's that and there's that and there is how you can work it out now um that's in a nutshell that's all the various bits and pieces i, I will come i see we've got a few questions here um and i i will go through these in a moment when uh once we've just finished off a few bits here so anyway let's just go to that now i'll finish off now with a little bit since thank you of kindly set this up for me um, and I'm using a BenQ monitor at the moment. Um, it, this is a 32 inch monitor um, and uh, which is what I'm watching this uh, presentation on which I'm running it from. Um, there are lots of good monitors um, and I'm going to say one of your reasons for getting a good monitor would be that you can do hardware calibration on it. Now if you've seen any of my videos that I've done Hopefully the screen looks perfectly okay on the video. That's because I've used the hardware calibration uh, on the uh, you know, on the monitor here to actually calibrate it to a really low color temperature to match the room lighting. It looks warm. It's awful for anything used, but it looks great on video. Um, the other reason I use it is because I can switch between calibrations on it, and I have a setting that does the REC 709 calibration. Um, and that makes it easier for me to edit videos. I'm still relatively new to videos. Um, I only took up making YouTube videos in the summer of 2020 at the behest of someone from Canon. Um, I do not do video professionally um, and have no great desire to do so because uh, I know how complex it is to do a good job of it. But um, just having a decent monitor that I can calibrate and trust uh, makes a bit of a difference. But uh, we'll just go on to that, on to the last one. Now, the questions and answers. Um, I will pop back on this. Um, oh, and uh, I must remember, um, Park Cameras are also sponsoring this as well. Uh, if you want to have a look at their range of BenQ monitors, there is a 5% discount code. Um, I'll leave that up for anyone who wants to make a note, so, note of it. And, oh, and there it is. There is my book again. Um, now, it's... Yeah. It's a real book. Uh, it's available as an ebook as well. But uh, personally, I, I much prefer, you know, as it were, sort of watching. Else. And I will now go back to. Um, ah, there we go. Um, and I believe I should hopefully be appeared for real again in this. So let's have a look at some of the questions that people have put in. Uh, as I said, I've had the one, um, the, you know, a bit about uh, Durham, which was very useful, uh, if only a couple of weeks too late. Uh, let's just go back to that, to that, and I'll now questions. Let's have a look. Um, can lenses be used with extension tubes? Yes, they can. I use them all the time. Um, in particular, I have a Canon TSE 90. Um, I use that with extension tubes, and that allows me to use it as a macro lens. Uh, works very well. The uh, using uh, extension tubes just gives allows you to focus closer it doesn't give you much extra tilt and things now i've got some videos looking at this as well at um yeah, at, at this with examples of using them and what difference it makes but yes you can do them perfectly well um another question from terrell uh, what focal length would you say is the more versatile not just for architecture but scenes uh, and picture i would say um the 24 mil is the most versatile for my use, uh, but that's because I, I just use it a lot. I like a widish angle lens. I would say that uh, for people, for other stuff, look at something like 55 mil. The uh, old TSE 45, which is quite a few years old, is still very usable and you can pick those up second hand. The TSE 50 that I showed towards the start is a very expensive lens just to use for shooting pictures of people. It's incredibly sharp, but um, yeah, that's yeah, that's what I would actually pick there. Um, right. Somebody else has asked here from David. Could you comment on the use of magnified viewfinder or focus peaking when using tilt? Um, 
I don't have focus peaking on my Canon 5DS I use, um, so I have to be a bit careful about that one. I do use focus peaking on the ESRP. I find it tremendously useful for visualizing where the plane of focus runs. Um, it's, it is a bit tricky doing it. You need to get the hang of doing it, but Focus peaking could be really useful. I am currently have a Hasselblad uh, 860-100C, so 100 megapixel medium format with a tilt shift adapter that I've been doing some testing on. And that has it as well, and it's useful. But um, do whatever works. I prefer for using the tilt tables for giving me an idea of how I want to set things up and then using focus peaking or actual just fine viewing on the screen to set it. There is an iterative, you know, an iterative focus method that I've got described elsewhere on how to go about getting accurate focus and how to set the plane of focus on an arbitrary plane so that you can match up an arbitrary plane in space with the plane of focus. Um, a little bit more complex than I really want to discuss here, but I've got a video that covers that. Let's have another look one here. Um, yeah. uh, it's another one about focus peaking. Yes, it's very useful. Uh, and some a question from John says, I assume no stabilization in the tilt shift lenses. No, nothing whatsoever. Um, if you use on an R5, R6 that has in-body stabilization, yes, I believe it will work. Um, I tested the TSC 17 with an adapter on the R5. In fact, I used the adapter that takes that allows you to put filters in it because the TSC 17 with that bulbous front element on it is really tricky to use filters with. And yes, it did. And um, it's certainly I'm I'm hoping that before long uh, that Canon will bring out a high megapixel. Uh, mirrorless uh, version of the R5 and that I will have one to replace my 5DS. Not because I don't like using the 5DS, it is just that uh, my close-up eyesight is not as good as it was, so using uh, the screen with focus peaking things will be useful to me. Um, I, f I find that uh, you know, the, the new mirrorless cameras work better when I allow for my eyesight, which is not as good as it was, certainly close up. Um, so that's that. Uh, that's uh, as no uh, question from Trevor here says uh, as no settings are recorded in the EXIF data, is it worth manually recording the information for each picture? I'd say yes, 100%. Um, the only slight issue I have with that is it's something I never ever remember doing. Um, if you are the kind of person who will remember to carry a notebook round and write such things down, I'm sure it might be useful, but no, uh, come to think of it, perhaps not. Um, it, it doesn't really make, make that much difference because at the moment the software doesn't allow for it. The one area where I would say that knowing your shift is useful is if you are using what I call the canvas extension method of lens correction. And this is something I first tried with the Samyang 24mm lens, where as I said, it's got some distinct distortions in it that you will notice uh, that knowing the shift there would be useful. But with the best will in the world, I just haven't I, I would never, ever remember to write stuff down. I never remember to write stuff down when I used film, and I don't now. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's never been that much of a problem. But, you know, if it's something you fancy doing, then by all means, uh, you know, try it. I'm hoping that uh, when Canon bring out new tilt shift lenses to go with this mythical new high megapixel mirrorless camera, that the lenses also include encoders in them to record the EXIF, uh, allow the EXIF data to be recorded, uh, such as the Hasselblad does, uh, which is uh, interesting uh, to do. Right. Uh, let's have a look. Um, Question from Dean, for someone that is new to tilt shift, how much help with the mirrorless camera be? Um, I'm going to say if for using tilt, yes, uh, we've mentioned focus uh, peaking, that helps of that. I find the viewfinders on them uh, very usable. Uh, depends, some people like DSLRs. Uh, with uh, using on mirrorless, the exposure is a bit easier to handle. Um, it's less thrown out than you get with uh, DSLR. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what's another one here. Uh, question from Susan. Can you use them for landscape photography? Um, 
if I had a means of quickly pulling up some photos, I would show yes, most definitely. Have a look at my articles, particularly the reviews I've got of lenses. I've, I've got photographs all over the place using landscape stuff. The picture of the on the cover of the book was using the TSC 17 uh, with slight vertical shift. Uh, that's the uh, pier at Whitby. And so that's it. Definitely for landscape. Be careful if you want to use landscape and use the tilt to try and get uh, more depth of field because you might not actually get it. Remember, you're not getting more depth of field. You're placing the plane of focus in a particular place. Right now, let's go around the for macro, which is the best for macro, a longer focal length for macro. Uh, I use a TSE 90. Um, and I can use that with extension tubes. Now uh, you can use them. You can use uh, uh, extenders as well. So if you take a TSE 24 and use a Canon 1.4 extender on it, you've got a 35 mil tilt shift lens that works very well as well. Um, longer focal lengths. The probably the best, and it's expensive though I'm afraid, is something like the TSE 135, the 135 mil lens from Canon, which is phenomenally sharp. Now, question from Andrew: You mentioned diagonal shift. Is that just rotating the lens? Yes, it is. Uh, the lens itself rotates on the mount to allow you to set the plane of shift, and you set that wherever you want. And a uh, question from Anthony here was the best focal length. Although I've answered that, that's for macro, it's a longer one. And a question here What would you suggest is the biggest difference between shooting with a tilt shift lens and a wide angle lens on a pano head? Well, if I'm shooting a panoramic shot, it depends on the image projection I want at the end. If I point a, a, a view, at a particular shot and, and shift the lens left, right, I'm effectively, and stitch those, I'm effectively getting the view I would get from a narrow crop of a wide angle lens. If I use a wide angle lens and rotate the pano head and then stitch the images together, I get a choice with a stitching software of whether I want a cylindrical or spherical or any other, even a rectilinear projection. So I get choices of what projection I can use. So um, I, they're quite different in, depending on what you want the picture to look like. Um, one thing you can do if you're doing shift and uh, stitching for a cylindrical is that you can shift the lens upwards and rotate the camera uh, tripod head and get pictures to stitch. And then you'll get a shifted image upwards, which you can then stitch to a cylindrical image. Now, I've got stuff covering this in some of the articles and things, and look look at that. So it's, it's a bit more complex than I really want to cover here. But, um, but anyway, it's, uh, I'm now just going to, let me just, And and we're back. We're almost finished here. Um, that's the last question. And um, so thank you for BenQ for asking me to do this and for Park Cameras for their involvement. Um, and uh, there is the offer there on the, if you fancy uh, looking at their range of BenQ monitors. And uh, thank you very much. Feel free to email me at North Flight Images if you've got specific questions. And um, I, I am contractually obliged to say this book is absolutely superb and it covers a lot of stuff about tilt shift lenses. So I hope that's been a useful uh, use to people. And uh, thank you and, um, and goodbye. <laughs>